Well, good morning. It's uh, it's good to be here. Uh, it's good to be in this nice new building. Lots lots of new things to look at. We've been here a few weeks. Um, thanks to our gracious friends, neighbors, brothers, and sisters at um, Reedy Creek, and uh, it's a blessing to come before you guys as a member of the church to bring the word to you. Um, and so I want to today we're going to talk about unity. You know. And uh, I just I want to start by saying I wish uh, I wish I could forget words um, that I've learned and be reintroduced them. And, and the reason I say that is because in some sense, um, especially in the Christian life, we we almost overexpose ourselves to terms to verbiage. It's like um, it's like it reminds me of this um, this painting in my in my house where I grew up. My mom has this this painting next to our like kitchen table. And it's like of like a it's pretty classic mid two thousands painting. Um, it's like a it's like a it's like a alleyway in in Tuscany, I would imagine something like that. Oh, and when she bought it, it was beautiful. I mean, it had such bright and vibrant colors. You know, the brick was so so textured and detailed. But over the years, Taylor can testify to this. Over the years, the sun from the the backside of the house has come in and beat it, and um, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> it's lost some of its grandeur. Um, it's still the same beautiful setting, but uh, the the paint. Um, goodness, it's probably not even real paint, but um, the the texture has has died. The the um, the colors have been overexposed to the sun, and what's happened is is that uh, over time, uh, this painting has really become a dull fragment of what it really is, which is a beautiful picture of the wonderful countryside in in Italy, and. Uh, that's sometimes kind of how I feel about like Christian words, you know, even, even things like the gospel. They're still great. They're still grandeur. They're still beautiful. But we've been so exposed to them um, that they, they seem to have lost their flavor. And so I encourage you guys today as we talk about unity, Christian unity, I want you to try your absolute best to view it with, with new eyes, what it might mean for you in this church here today. <clears throat> and, uh, oh, by the way, the key word here. I'm going to say it a few times, is king. So if you're keeping up with the key word, keep up with the word king. I changed it. I changed it. Sorry, Gary. Um, <laughs> That's how I do things. Um, but I'm going to do something a little different today. Before I introduce the topic, before I even reread the scripture, all the good stuff, we're actually going to, we're going to get the history lesson out of the way. Okay? This is good news for some of you guys. You're like, I don't want to hear a lecture. That's fine, um, but it's important. You've got to know this history. You're not going to understand the passage uh, if uh, you're not going to understand the passage if you don't understand the background as to what's happening here. Okay, so we're in the book of Romans, right? Paul has has laid out his sort of most um, his preeminent, his uh, you know sort of the apex of his theological treatise. The, you know, Romans is perhaps the most theologically dense letter Paul writes. Right, so. He covers the nature of our sin. Um, he covers the, the nature of the gospel and how we relate to one another. And all the way near the end of the book, here we are in chapter 15, Paul has gone on a long discourse about what it means to be unified. And uh, one of the biggest struggles for this early church, specifically in Rome, was this tension between Jewish and Gentile believers. Right? For over a thousand years, the Jewish people had been called by God to be set apart in the things they wore, in the things they ate, even in their customs and practices, the way they celebrated holidays. Um, but then Christ came. Christ came and fulfilled the law. Meaning that those who received Christ no longer were held to those same requirements. And, well, as you'd expect, some of the Jewish brothers and sisters really struggled. They struggled to let go of those things. One of which was this belief that they weren't supposed to eat unclean meat. And this is the situation in Paul in Rome that Paul is addressing in, in Romans. Um, and this is something he addresses in, in chapter 14 leading into chapter 15. So, in this case, just to give you some context, some less mature Christians, the weak, as Paul would refer to them, um, are saying things like, we shouldn't eat the meat, right? It might have been sacrificed to idols. Or maybe it's unclean. Whereas the more mature Christians, like Paul, he refers to as the strong, um, believe that nothing is unclean, right? We now have freedom in Christ to eat those very things. 
And this is important to realize. These are very serious matters. You're thinking like, come on, you know, we're talking about meat. But to, to this audience is Paul's writing. It's very important. And it's very serious to Paul, too, because he even explicitly says in verse 14 of chapter 14, he says, I know and am convinced, pretty definitive statement here, in the Lord Jesus, nothing is unclean in itself. Paul spoke in similar terms, by the way, about festivals and other customs. And so in Paul's eyes, this really wasn't up for debate. So that's, that's sort of the context. There's the history lesson. That's leading us into chapter 15. Um, Sandra wonderfully read, really, the, the, the climax of the passage. But I want to read verses 1 through 7 um, together. And so if you, if you have your Bibles, let's open them back up. Going to Romans 15. Romans 15. And we're going to read verses 1 through 7 together. I don't mind waiting, so, you know, take your time. I think as we, as we listen to what Paul has to say, we're going to be perhaps, you know, a little shocked by, by some of his, his, his words. All right, here we go. Romans 15, verse 1. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Let's pray. God, help us. Uh, Lord, I, you know, I, I thought a long time about what I would say today, many, many hours, but... Um, God, ultimately, I have to admit right here before you, before these people, that um, if it was up to just my rhetorical ability, my ability to, to craft a message, um, God, we would, we would fail. Um, we need your spirit to intervene. We pray that as I proclaim and herald the word you have before us, that I would get out of the way and people would, people would be ministered by your spirit. And they would hear you speak clearly. So, God, I pray that you do work today as we know you will. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So each week, uh, we've been speaking on another aspect of our goal at Rooted Church to engage the cities. And you might be asking, okay, Matt, you know, what, what is talking about unclean meat, festivals, Jews versus Gentiles? What, what does all this have to do with engaging the cities? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, here's the answer. I'm convinced that when we aren't a people who are willing to bear with each other's failures, fighting to preserve this unique unity we have, nothing less than the ministry of the gospel is at stake. I'll say that again. I'll state it slightly different. You know, what does bearing have, uh, with one another have to do with engaging the cities? Well, because when we, rooted church, are not properly united, the ministry of the gospel suffers. Okay, and I intend, by the way, to spend the next few minutes explaining how. Um, Christian unity is a lot like, bear, bear with me on this one, we're going long term on this one. But Christian unity is a lot like a, a recipe you pull out for the holidays, special occasions. Uh, it's, you put this incredible amount of work in it, right? You, you know, you don't have six hours to make the best turkey you've ever made. Or in my case, I have these really amazing mashed potatoes I make, and they take a long time, okay? I don't know why exactly, but they do, okay? Uh, and I can't make them all the time. They're, they, they, I use a very specific type of potato cooking method, um, and I, I try to buy the nicest. I buy the specific brand of, of butter. It's, I put a lot of work into it, okay? And so when I take that bite, 
okay, of those mashed potatoes I make, maybe the turkey, whatever it is for you, you can think in your head. Oh, it tastes just a little bit better because you know what went into it, right? And so what you risk is that when you make this amazing recipe and you put it before the people you love, um, unfortunately, they're not thinking, oh, gosh, you know, Matt put so much effort into these mashed potatoes. Let me really savor it. No, they're not doing that. In fact, they, they risk... Um, they risk glossing over and just sort of like plopping them on their, their plate, you know, uh, and to disregard it, what goes into it, and they eat it. It's just like anything else. It's a little disappointing. Well, Christian unity is a little bit like that, and, and here we're bringing it home. Um, it's easy to gloss over if you don't understand what goes into it. So I could serve to all of you on a spoon a call to action. I could say, root a church, go, be unified, right? Maybe one or two of you would be like, oh, maybe I should be unified, right? Or... Or, this is what I'm planning to do today, I could break down the recipe, right? In other words, I could show you the parts that make the whole, okay? And then that way, when the time comes to taste, to, to, to experience what a unified church is really like, you'll treasure it. You'll appreciate it. You'll want it more. That's my goal today, is to give you just a zoom in on a little bit of what real church unity looks like. Okay, hopefully that's the end of the, the food comparisons. It's part of the reason why, by the way, I've called the sermon the ingredients of Christian unity. I guess I was hungry when I wrote the sermon, but it still applies. Uh, um, and I think hopefully you'll see why soon. Okay, all right. So in this passage, we find some key ingredients. We find what makes up this unity. We so want, and what are they? Well, number one, it's very clear. It's bearing with one another. Look at verse one and two. We, who are strong, have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good and build him up. Verse 1 and 2, they make a familiar point. You know, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, right? And if you've read Romans, this is not new, okay? Romans um, 14, 15 says, If your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Verse 19 says, let us pursue what makes peace for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Verse 21, it says, it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. So the point throughout chapter 14 has been, we should be willing to forego our freedom in matters of things like meat and drink. If you can avoid destroying a weak brother and instead build up his faith. So, we can conclude there were strong and there were weak in the church of Rome, and we can also assume that there are strong and the weak in the church today. And in our context, these types of spiritual hang-ups might revolve around social do's and don'ts. Many of them you will be very familiar with. Um, what, What type of clothes is appropriate for a Christian to wear? The use of jewelry, tattoos. Practicing certain things, social drinking, recreational gambling, dancing. Many Christians think of these as as gray areas, some obviously more than others. Um, But because, you know, people think, okay, well, these are gray areas, we don't really know what to do. So, yeah, I can, you know, I can take a step back and be like, yeah, there's some different interpretations, so I'm not going to worry about it. But I don't, you know, I think you might make a mistake there. I think a common mistake with this passage is to assume that Paul is only talking about these gray areas in the Christian life. Um, I don't think that's, no, I don't think that's true, because if we read the text, and we are to be students of the text, we'll see that, that Paul was actually not talking about a gray area, because our liberty from mosaic food restrictions was actually quite a black and white issue for Paul. He says this, we already read the verse, this is what he says. He says, Paul was, quote, convinced, he knows and is convinced in the Lord Jesus, nothing is unclean in itself. So before we conclude with this ser- sermon, maybe I can lighten up and you know, be better about bearing with the weak on these gray areas. I would say not so fast. Uh, Paul is calling us actually to do, I think, more than that. Bear with one another, even on important disagreements. Have you noticed there's no gr- grace today in, in, in disagreement? I mean, surely that's true in, in the world, but I would say it's, it's also sadly apparent in, in much of the, the American church. I mean, pick any one issue, right? Social justice, 
women in the church, abuse, how we handle these things. They're all hot topics in the church. Um, and what I find, sadly, more often than not, is a complete and utter inability to bear with the weak, uh, the failures of, of, of the weaker brother on these issues. I see a, a staunch sort of foot on the ground. I'm not going to move. And if you don't, you are failing the church. You're failing Christ. You're failing me. And essentially, it, it amounts to what would practically be disfellowship. They say, I'm not going to be, I'm pushing you out. So we're called to bear with the weaker in faith and understanding. But there's, to one important end, read again, it says, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. And there's a difference between bearing and putting up with the failures of another believer just to let it slide, right? Because you're like, I don't want to deal with these touchy topics, you know? That's not what Paul's talking about here. He's not saying avoid... <laughs> These, these, these issues. Um, he's not saying don't have convictions. In fact, I would argue there's a very clear scriptural example of Paul saying we should strive to be convicted about the things we believe. No, 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 no. That's not what he's saying. He's saying bear with each other in order to build each other up in faith. Now, I have to pause here because there's one important clarification to make about this process, okay? I would argue that scripture bears us to, it, it compels us to bear with one another only in regard to non-essential things and when it will build up another brother. There are limits to unity. This is, this is so important. This is so important. There are limits to unity. And we know these limits apply because in, Genesis, uh, in Galatians 1, Paul's, you know, he's expanding his discussion of the gospel. And he says, he said, am I trying to please man? That's what he says, quote, am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. And in this context, Paul is talking about the gospel. So in other words, critical issues or crucial issues about the content of the gospel are not up for debate. And when they're at stake, Paul says he will not change the gospel to please man. John Piper says it like this, when the gospel is changed, people are destroyed. If we can please people for their upbuilding, the upbuilding of their faith, a mutual faith in the gospel of Christ, we do it. But if that pleasing, that bearing up, destroys them and destroys the content of the gospel, we don't do it. We don't do it. Isn't it interesting? I think, you know, Paul doesn't teach so as to get rid of, of one or the other you notice that? Like he says, he says, bear with the failings of the weak. Bear with it. Okay? Which means to lift up, to carry. The Greek word here means to lift off of, to take on as, as your burden. He doesn't, he also doesn't try to turn one into the other. No, his, his language actually assumes that there will always be those who are strong and weaker in the church. And if that doesn't strike you as odd, let me put it this way. If I were to stand up here on Sunday, oh, that's interesting. It's what I'm doing right now. And I said, hey, church, some of you are weak on this issue and some of you are strong. What would you think I'd do? I mean, honestly, the next thing I'd probably do is say, hey, weak people, here's how you become strong. Right? But that's actually not the way Paul handles it right here. Okay? That's not, that's not how he handles it. And this is probably why he doesn't try to fix it in this passage. The principle here is that he's teaching us how to live with it because it's always going to be there. There will always be weaker brothers and sisters and there will always be stronger ones in the faith. And we owe it. We owe it to God. This word obligation, you are obligated. It's a good word, but it, it comes from the same root in Greek that means to owe, to be indebted. To be indebted. We owe it to God to bear with the weaknesses and the failures of those weaker in the faith. Just to take this point home, think about this very famous passage, Philippians 2, 3. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not only look to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. We serve God first, others next, and ourselves last. So what is the first ingredient to this necessary Christ-exalting unity, we bear with one another. We bear with one another. And this kind of bearing, by the way, it's, it's the type of, type of bearing that says, this issue is important to me, 
It has real implications on our life and ministry, but I love you, brother and sister, and I will not let this issue keep me from being united to you as one body under Jesus and under the gospel. Easier said than done, right? Sure, but here's the thing. It has been done. Which brings me to the second ingredient, second component of Christian unity, and that is the example of Jesus. Let's read verses 1 and 2 again, but this time we're going to add verse 3. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but, as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So we bear the weaknesses of our brothers and sisters, but why? What's the reason Well, it's because that's what King Jesus did. And he did so, so that we could be transformed into his likeness. Jesus selflessly served us. He bore the failings of our weakness in a much greater way. And he did it not to serve himself. This is so important. You have to get this. Practically speaking, I would say you have to know, truly know in your heart, you have to know Christ bore your failures, or you will not have the strength to bear others. Because if that's the case, if you don't have a full, a a true and complete understanding that Christ bore um, your failures, you you leave room for even a seed of self-righteousness to to be at play. So essentially, this is what I'm saying. If the basis of your bearing with others is, yeah, Christ died for me, you know, uh, he bore my weaknesses, but, you know, I'm a good Christian. I can handle others' weaknesses and not... I'm fully and utterly in Christ, and he bore my weaknesses, you'll fail. I mean, you won't won't have the strength, the emotional strength to bear the weaknesses of others. Because when the time comes to choose unity, practically speaking, grace over division, you'll be too bothered by their failures. I've seen this time and time again. I'm speaking from experience here. Um, You'll be too bothered by their wrong view of this A, B, C, D issue. You'll be bothered by their behavior on A, B, C, and D um, until you realize how utterly undeserving you are of God's love and how amazing it is that Christ bore your failures. Yours, not yours individually. Even the smallest seed of self-righteousness will hinder your effort to bear someone else's. So to prove that that was the case, Paul actually quotes the Old Testament here. He says, uh, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. This is a quote from from Psalm 69. It's one of the most quoted passages in regards to Jesus' ministry, where King David in in the psalm is lamenting the unjust suffering of a righteous man. And and Jesus, he refused to please himself, fully embracing God's will, identifying himself with his name, his will, the cause and glory of the Father. And the insults that were intended for God fell on him. And the same, by the way, will be true of all who seek to honor God by serving others and bearing God with their failures. The more like Christ we become, I would say the more we will endure for others. It reminds me of of, of Peter, 1 Peter 2.21 that says, "For uh, for for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. And if that's the goal, you know, to be like Christ, you might be wondering, okay, well, Let's bring it home. What does this have to do with unity and engaging the cities? Well, Jesus answers this um, in the form of a prayer, and a prayer that's commonly referred to as the high priestly prayer. This is what he says, John 17, 20 through 21. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through the word. Listen closely. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. And they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. You see, being like Jesus, following the example of the king, it's an essential ingredient to Christian unity. Because being transformed into the likeness of Christ and becoming more unified are really one and the same action, right? And that's good news because Jesus here connects unity with the ministry of the gospel. So if you want proof that the ministry of the gospel is at stake on this question of unity and bearing with one another, you don't have to look any further than this verse. He says, verse 21, that they may all be one so that the world may believe that you have sent me. 
later in the prayer, he, he says it again, but this, listen to what he adds. He says, you know, they may all be one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and, and love them even as you loved me. I mean, just let that sink in for a minute. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that in us being transformed, in us receiving a new heart and salvation, when Christ looks to us, he's able, he's able to love us like he loves Jesus. That's pretty amazing. Um, if you haven't pondered that and thought about that, I encourage you to do so. Okay, all right, so if we want to engage the cities and beyond with the gospel of Christ, we must be unified by, one, bearing the failures of one another, bearing with one another, and two, by following the example of Jesus. And Paul could have stopped there. He really could have, right? His, his key message, which is, he could have said, bear with the weaker brother like Jesus did with you, period, end of sentence. But that's not what he did. He didn't do that. Instead, Paul does something weird, right? Right after quoting scripture, Psalm 69, he interrupts his own comment to make a point about God's word. Isn't that interesting? It's as if Paul, it's, it's as if Paul can't get through his thought without mentioning the word and why we need it. It's music to my Baptist ears. I love it. Thus, we come to our third ingredient, third component of this unity, and that is the word of endurance and encouragement. So we're going to read verses 1 through 3, but now we're going to add verse 4. Listen to how this evolves. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written, here it is, verse 4, for whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through encouragement, of the scriptures, we might have hope. Paul says what was written in the former days was written for our instruction. What is he talking about? What was written in the former days? It can't be the New Testament, right? He's, he's currently pinning it, right? When he writes this letter to the Romans, he is, he's, he's doing the process of, of bringing together the New Testament. What is Paul talking about? Can somebody actually answer that? Does anybody know? Surely somebody. What was written in the late? What, what, it's actually quite an easy. What was written in the former days? Somebody knows. I can hear it in your mind. The Old Testament. That's exactly right. Yeah, they were, good job. Didn't Paul just say we were free from all the rituals and rules of the Mosaic Law in the Old Testament? And now we're supposed to get endurance and encouragement from that? Is he contradicting himself? Well, of course not. Paul is talking about the Old Testament. However, even though we are free from the Mosaic laws and customs, that doesn't mean the Old Testament is useless to us. No, in fact, quite the opposite. Paul says that endurance, uh, through endurance and through the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. Here's the point. The power of the Old Testament is that it testifies to King Jesus. I'll say it again. The power of the Old Testament is that it testifies to Jesus. And this is why it gives us hope. Because when God told Abraham that he intended to bless the nations through his lineage, he was talking about Jesus. When God established that the people of Israel would need a sacrificial, a spotless sacrificial lamb to atone for their sins, he was talking ultimately about Jesus. When he told Moses that he would give his people a new heart, because their sin had kept them from even entering the promised land. He was talking about what Jesus would do. When he told David that he would raise a king to his own throne, he was talking about Jesus. And when God promised that his, uh, through his prophets that he would one day restore his people who were exiled and ripped from everything they know, he was talking about Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the Old Testament matters because in it, we see God's plan to restore his people after the fall, pointing to a Messiah, a better Abraham, a better Moses, a better David, who would at the great turning point of history bear the wrath we deserve for our sins, be raised from the dead and restored and restore our relationship with God once and for all. So don't turn your nose up at any part of God's word. Learn it, study it. Because in it, and especially in the Old Testament, we see a God who makes a promise and keeps it. 
And that enables us to endure this side of heaven and encourages us to have hope. Hope that one day this, this hope will be materialized as we stand face to face with our Savior and King. Free from hurt, free from sin. No longer needing to bear with the weak because we will all be made strong. You know, sometimes I feel like we read the Bible, um, you know, as like a, you know, a history book, especially the Old Testament. We're like, oh, it's just some history. But maybe we should read it more, you know, like, like an ancestral record, right? Like, I mean, do you realize that you have been grafted into God's family, his chosen people? And that by nature of that, the stories, the poems, the songs, all of it, it's, it's all records of your people, your lineage. Now, I know, okay, I, I just have to say, I know some believers would probably have a problem with me phrasing it that way, um, but... Bear with me. Perhaps I'm the weaker brother in that situation. Regardless, my point is, is it about time we treated the Old Testament the way Paul did, as the very word of God. It is essential to our goal of Christ-exalting, mission-empowering unity. So to sum up, if we want to engage the cities and beyond with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we must do so by being unified. And we do that by bearing with the failings of one another, by following the example of Jesus, testified in the word of encouragement and endurance. Perhaps Paul sums it up better in the prayer that Sandra read to you earlier. And so I want to end today's sermon the same way Paul ends this passage. Look to verse 5 through 7. Paul is so, um, clearly he, he is so marked by these what he has claimed about bearing the failings of others by following the example of Christ, testified in the word of encouragement. He prays this, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ, that together you may with one voice, the term here in Greek, by the way, it's like one mouth, with one voice, with one mouth, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And so today, you might be sitting there, it might be tempting at times to think, ah, but when we don't agree on these, you know, these issues, these secondary, tertiary issues, these non-essential issues, we actually risk disrupting the gospel. But I think that's wrong. I really do. I, I think that when we bear with one another, when we follow the example of Jesus and don't divide on these, these issues, but instead pr choose to preserve unity, I think we actually raise up in the value and the beauty and the grandeur of the gospel. We give it the special regard that it deserves among our people. So as my family, um, my wife and, and our two kids prepare to leave in the next few weeks, my prayer for Rooted Church is that um, you would be known more for this type of Christ-exalting, unified, selfless regard for one another. And not for your agreements on even non-essential matters. Because you know what? Our agreements on those matters, they're not going to save a single soul in this city. Only the good news of our King and Savior Jesus Christ can do that. That's it. Let's pray together.